Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Oscar. I'm the Equipment and Observation Officer for AstroSoc and I'm going to be giving a Sky This Month talk, just to give you an overview of what's in the night sky, how you can see it, and then how you can make the most of it. And then at the end, I'm going to give a little bit of information about some buying advice for telescopes to help you to help you see the best that you can in the sky. So starting this month, we have the moon. Um, nice and simple and easy to see. Uh, full moon is on the 19th, so that's just a few days away. Um, and the moon offers great views with both telescope and binoculars and just with your eyes. Um, you can easily see the craters and the great seas, which are those um, dark spots you can see on the image I've got there. The moon cycles between new and full. Um, new moon, the moon is not visible, um, which is really great for seeing uh, deep sky objects such as galaxies and nebulae, as you don't have that great big source of light. And then full moon means you can see the moon in its, all its glory, which is better for visual observers um, who don't have to worry about light pollution so much. The planets are also out as well um, until the end of the year. So Jupiter, Saturn and Venus are all visible um, until about the end of December. Um, Venus you can see as a bright dot to the southwest, close to where the sun has set, very low to the horizon. Um, Jupiter is a very bright object to the south, visible until about midnight, low-ish. So these will be sort of disappearing below the horizon as the year draws to an end. So good opportunity to go out and see them now before they're gone. Um, and this is where you can find Jupiter and Saturn in particular. These are ones that offer you the best views. Um, you can see the moons of Jupiter, the rings of Saturn with a small telescope. Um, so if you look to the south, just above the horizon, you can see two bright dots. They're pretty distinctive. There's no other really bright stars around there. So good luck finding those. And as I said, make the most of it as it might be a while before they return. Uh, coming into November, where we are now, we have uh, a comet, um, 67P. It's not, not visible to naked eye, sadly, but it is currently the brightest comet in the sky. And this is significant um, because in 2016, a lander launched by the ESA touched down on the surface, and that's the first time such a feat has been achieved. Um, and yeah, you're not going to be able to see it with your naked eye, but if you happen to own a large telescope and are reasonably good at star hopping, then you might be able to find it. We also have the Leonid meteor shower, so the peak of that is today. You've got meteors every four minutes, um, and that's in the Leo constellation. Um, and then we have a full moon on the 19th again, so that's in just a few days. So keep an eye out for that. Um, if you want to go out with your telescope or binoculars or whatever, go and have a look at the moon. Um, the moon is a really good accessible target because anyone can see it anywhere, um, even in the heart of Birmingham. Um, December uh, is looking really, really good. Um, got loads of great stuff going on. So the moon is new on the 4th and full on the 19th again. Uh, we have the winter solstice on the 21st of December, so this is the longest night of the year. Um, really good for astronomers. Uh, most people hate it because it's cold and it's dark, um, but it means if you want to go outside and observe the night sky, then you get the longest period to do so. So it's really this time of year when we see a lot of the activity in going out and looking at the stars. Um, also have another interesting comet. So this is C slash 2021A1. Um, and this is going to be really close to Earth, so just two, 0 0.2 atomic, uh, sorry, uh, astronomical units. So that's just uh, a fifth of the distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is pretty close. Um, and it will be visible with binoculars. Unfortunately, it's going to be up pretty early in the morning, um, as this is the only time when it really comes above the horizon. So you want to be out between 3 and 6 a.m. Um, up until the 9th of December. But I promise it's going to be so worth it. If you've got some binoculars, um, it's in the Booties constellation, 3, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. about, um, and I'd really recommend a look. And then we have a fantastic meteor shower, the Geminid meteor shower. Uh, it's one of the best in the years, 120 meteors an hour. Um, so that's a meteor every 30 seconds. Going to be an amazing sight to see. I really recommend. Um, the peak is going to be on the 14th of December. If you can get out, um, somewhere with little light pollution, have a look. It's in the Gemini constellation, um, observable for most of the night. 
if you can get out somewhere with a little light pollution, I really recommend it. It's going to be a fantastic sight to see. So that's about it until the end of the year. Um, I thought I'd just give a little bit of uh, advice about observing, because I say a little bit, you know, you might want to use some binoculars this or a telescope with this, um, but what's re what really should you do? What equipment should you buy? Well, at a basic level, a pair of binoculars will provide a much better view of the sky than just using your eyes. Um, so the, these help by magn magnifying the view and concentrating the light so you can see fainter objects that you'd normally miss with the naked eye. And that's the same principle as telescopes work. And these can let you see things like galaxies, globular clusters, nebulae, all of these more interesting, harder to see objects um, that you normally wouldn't be able to. Um, binoculars are really good because they're very simple and a lot of people have them already. Um, they're quite cheap as well. So if you have any old pair of binoculars, I would recommend using them. If you want to go out and buy some, I would recommend 10 by 50 or greater. For example, 20 by 80 if you want to spend a bit more money. And a 10 by 50 is about 50 pounds. And these are sort of where you want to be starting at the lower end of budget. Now, moving on from binoculars, you have telescopes. Um, and here, a lot of people fall into a trap. So, to explain what this is, if you go onto a popular shopping uh, online website, for example, um, and you type in telescope, this is what you get. Something that looks like this, and there's about like 10 choices of these things. Do not buy one of these. They are terrible. Most people get into the pitfall of buying something that looks like this, and the optics are bad, the mount is bad. You know, it's reasonably expensive. This is retail price £100, and you're getting a rubbish piece of plastic out of it, essentially. Um, so, what this is what you shouldn't look for. What should you look for? Well, for visual, I'd recommend a particular type of telescope called a Dobsonian. And these are what that looked like. So you've basically got a big tube with a mirror at the end. Um, and these are very cheap to produce. There's not a lot of sort of expensive parts in them. It's just a big tube, a uh, stand, and then the mirror is the only thing that's sort of slightly valuable in that. Um, but they, they're they very cheap to produce and you get lots of diameter, lots of light gathering capability for relatively little cost. So a six inch one of these might cost you 200 pounds, a 10 inch one might cost you 400 pounds. Um, so moving on from a pair of binoculars, I would get a bigger Dobsonian as you can afford is the general rule of thumb and you can store, of course. So these will provide you really, really good views of the night sky. They're very easy to use, very user friendly. You don't need lots of experience or massive textbooks. It's just point at where you want to look at, have a look through, and you can easily see galaxies, nebulae, globular clusters, all of these interesting objects. So just to reiterate, um, I would start by getting a pair of binoculars, and then if you want to spend a bit more money and get yourself a telescope, get a Dobsonian style telescope, rather than one of sort of the cheap toys telescopes that you find on Amazon. Okay, well, that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Have you ever wanted to look back in time? Ever wondered if aliens are really out there or how planets form? Then you should be really excited about the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. Launching next month, it's the biggest telescope that we've ever put in space. Hi, my name's Natalie. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Birmingham. And today I'm gonna to show you why the James Webb is so cool, both literally and figuratively, and what it's gonna do for astronomy. We've been putting telescopes into space for over 40 years. And we do this because of the Earth's clouds and atmosphere don't get in the way. And we're too impatient to only take observations at nighttime. If you're thinking of these amazing images of space that you've seen as maybe a screensaver, or if you're like me, used to share on a Tumblr blog, you're probably thinking of an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble was launched into low Earth orbit in 1990 with an intended lifetime of around 15 years. When they got it up into space, everybody held their breath for the first image and it was blurry. Here on the left, you can see the image they got and it should look like what it does here on the right. So they had to send some astronauts up to go and fix this. With a few more maintenance trips over the years, the Hubble Space Telescope is still working today, 31 years later. 
It's taken over 1.5 million observations and holds a very dear place in many astronomers' hearts. And the James Webb Space Telescope is its successor, which begs the question, why do we need a new space telescope? We've come a long way since Hubble and now have capabilities to make much bigger and more powerful telescopes. Both telescopes here are category telescopes, which mean they use a series of mirrors to focus the light. But the mirror in the James Webb Space Telescope is much bigger, as you can see here to scale, than the mirror in the Hubble Telescope. This is one of the reasons it's over a hundred times more powerful. But it's not really as simple as that. This isn't really an apples to apples comparison and James Webb is a successor, but not replacing Hubble. They look at different things and have different science goals. So don't make us choose between our telescopes. If you've ever passed light through a prism, seen the reflection of a CD or a rainbow after a storm, you'll know that light can be split up into a spectrum with red at one end and violet at the other. But aside from visible light, there's a whole array of other types of light that we can't see. And altogether, we call this the electromagnetic spectrum. We order it by how energetic the types of light are or how long their wavelengths are. Violet is a very energetic type of light with a short wavelength and red is less energetic with a longer wavelength. If you went to an even longer wavelength, you'd get to infrared. We can't see infrared with our eyes, but we can make cameras and telescopes that can. You can test this at home by taking an old TV remote. If you look at the little emitter on the end and you press a button, you will see nothing. But if you look at it through your phone camera, you will see a little light, and this is your phone detecting the infrared. We can choose what types of light our telescopes see when we design them, and then convert them back into visible light when we want to see the images. Hubble mostly looked at space in visible light, with a little bit of infrared and a little bit of ultraviolet too. But Webb will look at less visible light and much more infrared. But why infrared? Firstly, because infrared is longer in wavelength, it can penetrate further into dust clouds in space where visible light would have been scattered. This means we can peer into these dust clouds, which is in a lot of cases where we want to look because this is where stars and planets are formed as the dust is brought together by gravity. You can see this really clearly in this image of the Carina Nebula, where on the left, you can see all of this dust in visible light, which is cool in itself, but on the right, in infrared, we can peer through the dust and see systems that we wouldn't have been able to see before lurking inside it. NASA even showed us the capabilities of their infrared camera, and they showed that on Twitter using a bin bag. They showed this guy, and you can see his hand through the bin bag with the infrared camera, which is much less glamorous, but much more true to working in research, I would say. That's not the only reason to use infrared, though. You might have heard that we see the sun as it was eight minutes ago. That's because it takes eight minutes for light to get from the sun to our eyes. Our next closest star, Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light years away, which means that we see it as it was 4.2 years ago. The next closest galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, is 2.5 million light years away. So we're looking 2.5 million years into the past when we see it. So how far back can we really look? After the Big Bang, the universe was like a dense, hot soup of particles, and light couldn't travel very far without being absorbed and re-emitted. This means the universe was opaque, and there's a limit to how far back we can look using light. As the universe started to cool, elements like hydrogen could form, and light started to travel again. But since the Big Bang, the universe has been expanding, space has been getting bigger, and light from the first stars and galaxies has been getting stretched out, their wavelength getting longer and being pushed into the infrared part of the spectrum. This means that using infrared, the James Webb Space Telescope will get to see some of the earliest galaxies forming over 13 billion years ago. In order to do all this, Webb uses four different instruments. Here you can see three of them work in the near infrared part of the spectrum, and one of them works in the far infrared part of the spectrum. Let's go one by one to what these instruments actually do. First up, we have NearCam, the near infrared camera. 
NearCam is Webb's primary imager, and it will be able to see light from the earliest galaxies forming, as well as light from stars in nearby galaxies and stars in our own Milky Way. It's kind of like binoculars in the sense that it looks at two sections of the sky next to each other. NearCam is also equipped with something called a coronagraph, which allows us to look at faint objects around much brighter objects. It does this by blocking out the light from the extremely bright object, kind of like if you put your hand in front of the sun to look at the view in front of you. Here on the right, you can see an example of a chronograph of the sun, where by blocking out the light of the sun, we can see the things around it. NearCam hopes to do this to be able to track the motion of exoplanets and determine some of the characteristics of them. Next up, we've got NearSpec, the Near Infrared Spectrograph. Light from galaxies and stars actually contains an imprint of what they're made of. This is because the molecules inside the galaxies and the stars absorb different parts of the light spectrum and what parts they absorb is specific for each element, like a fingerprint or a barcode. And we can use spectrographs to decode these barcodes. NearSpec will match up spectrums from star formation areas and young distant galaxies to study their chemical composition. However, to be able to gather enough light, we need to measure some of these sources for up to 100 hours, which is a huge amount of time to be looking at one thing. So NearSpec has been designed so that it can look at 100 objects simultaneously. It does this using a micro shutter array, which is a grid where you can choose the spaces for the light to come through, except each grid space is thinner than a human hair. Here you can see a tiny needle pushing down one of these grid space openings and the effect that it might have on the sky with a few different grid spaces looking at some specific objects. Next up, we have MIRI, the Med Infrared Instrument. This is a camera and a spectrograph rolled up into one, but it looks at longer wavelengths of infrared. This is great for working in conjunction with NearCam because it means that it can look in more detail at objects that NearCam has pointed out, using its longer infrared to peer through dust clouds that NearCam wouldn't be able to see through. It also has a spectrograph, so it can look at dimmer objects around a bright object. And it is a wide field camera, which means that it has the job of taking the truly jaw dropping images that everybody loves Hubble so much for. Last but not least, we have two instruments rolled into one. We have the fine guidance sensor and the near infrared slitless spectrograph. This fine guidance sensor allows Webb to point really accurately at sources so that it can take really precise images. We just saw that we can use spectroscopy to study what is in stars and galaxies, but we can also use it to study what is in the atmospheres of exoplanets. When the light from a background star passes through the atmosphere of an exoplanet, the molecules in the atmosphere again imprint on this light. And this means with our spectrograph, we can see what is inside its atmosphere. This is really exciting in the hunt for alien life, because when we look out into space at the signs for life, our only blueprint is what we have here on Earth. So we look for what we need here on Earth. This spectrum here corresponds to oxygen. And this possibly suggests that something on this planet is replenishing the source of oxygen. So this would be a really interesting planet to have a look at in the search for life. So these are our instruments and they require a lot of care to work properly. Infrared is given off when heat is given off, which means that we have to keep our instruments extremely cold. Otherwise they will just start detecting themselves. So how cold do we have to keep them? At the most, minus 235 degrees Celsius, which I'm sure we can agree is pretty chilly. So we have to combat this. The most important thing to do is to block out the sunlight, as we don't want any of the sunlight interfering with our measurements or heating up our instruments. And Webb does this using a sun shield. The sun shield is about as big as a tennis court, and it's made of five layers of a material called captain. The thickest layer is about 1 20th of a millimeter thick, but even then it's reinforced so it's able to survive meteorite damage. This sun shield keeps Webb at our minus 235 degrees Celsius, but one of our instruments, Miri, 
because of its longer wavelength detection requires even colder temperatures. So there's also a cryo cooler to keep that even colder at minus 266 degrees Celsius. So we've got our detectors running. Now we need some light to get them observing. James Webb Space Telescope has a primary mirror to collect this light made out of 18 hexagons, made out of beryllium and coated with gold. A telescope's power is proportional to how large its mirror is. And you can see in these pictures, it's pretty large. In fact, it's so powerful that the James Webb Telescope can detect the heat signature of a bumblebee on the moon. Hexagonal mirrors were chosen as when they're put together, they don't leave any gaps between them whilst making this concave mirror shape that will focus the light onto a secondary mirror and then a third and then another one after that. This focuses that huge amount of light we caught with our primary mirror into a much smaller space. To keep it in focus, the mirrors have tiny motors or actuators, which can move the mirror by one ten thousandth the width of a human hair at a time. So we've seen what Webb can do and how, but the name of this talk made some pretty bold claims. So let's go over the main science goals for what we hope Webb can do. First of all, we've got the early universe, looking back to the formation of the first stars and galaxies after the Big Bang. And then by looking at those first galaxies and comparing them to galaxies we see closer by, we can have a look at how they evolve over time. We also hope to be able to look at life cycles of stars peering through the dust with our infrared cameras and being able to see how they form. Because we know that stars come from dust, come from nebulae, and we know that their life cycles end in creating nebulae. So we have a kind of um, egg and chicken type situation here, and we want to see what that looked like in the first days. And then we also hope to look into the atmospheres of exoplanets, looking not just for signs of life, but what else is going on in these other worlds. I hope we can all agree now that this is pretty exciting. And astronomers have been excited about the James Webb Space Telescope for a really long time. In fact, a little too long. When James Webb was first announced, a launch date of 2007 was planned for. In 2007, the iPhone was released for context. I was 10 years old, so it was a really long time ago. And since then, it's just been postponement after postponement after postponement after postponement all the way up until today. Naturally, it has been part of many, many an internet meme. As astronomers, we try not to let our hopes get too high. We have been hurt before, but it's better to get it right and spend longer doing it, postponing it, than it is to rush it and have it go up too soon because this has to go right the first time. Unlike with Hubble, which we went up to go and fix a few times, we cannot do that with James Webb. Once it goes up, it goes up. One of these delays was caused by a rip in the sun shield, and this cannot happen, so we have to make sure we get this right. This also means we can't extend the lifetime of James Webb like we have with Hubble. We have some fuel on board as propellant, but once it's gone, it's gone. We need this propellant because the radiation from the sun actually causes a pressure on the sun shield and pushes it away, kind of like a sail in the wind, and so we need propellant to be able to put it back in place in its orbit. The electrics are powered by solar panels, so we can still communicate with it, but once the repellent's gone, we can't adjust its position, so we just kind of have to listen to it go off into space on its own, which is quite sad. Even with all this, we do hope to get at least 10 years out of it, and these estimates are usually quite conservative, so possibly a bit more than that as well. The reason we can't just go up and maintain it is because it's traveling much, much further than Hubble. Hubble is in low Earth orbit, which means that we can go up and maintain it. But we're sending Webb 1.5 million kilometers away to a sweet spot in the orbit between the Earth and the Sun called a Lagrange point. This is because it needs to be much further away from the Sun, as with it measuring in infrared, the Sun will get in the way of its observations. At the Lagrange point, objects will move with the Earth relative to the Sun at the same rate, maintaining its position away from us and making it easy to communicate with. Of the five Lagrange points, it's going to the second one, or Lagrange 2 or L2, as this is the one behind the Earth. 
but it won't be sat directly on the Lagrange point. It will be orbiting around it so that it doesn't go in and out the shadow of the Earth, which would mess up our observations and make too many temperature fluctuations. There's already a few other space telescopes going around this Lagrange point, so we know that it works okay. So far, Webb has made its way to the launch site at French Guiana via the Panama Canal. It will launch into the space on the Ariane 5 rocket. You may remember that it's about the size of a tennis court, which is much too bulky to get it into space easily as it is. So it actually folds up just like you can see here in the rocket and on its way to L2, which will take about a month, it will fold out. Once it gets there, we're looking at about six months of calibration before we can actually get down to the science, but we probably will get some first images before then as tests. So that'll be really exciting. So I hope you're all as excited as I am for the future of this telescope. From watching the first galaxies form to how they evolve to science for alien life, it's a big deal in the future for astronomy. The launch will be right in the middle of the day for us at 12.20 p.m. and it will be on a Saturday too. So I don't know about you, but I'm going to be watching it live on the NASA website with some popcorn and crossing my fingers for its safe travels. So I think that's all that's left to say is good luck to the James Webb Space Telescope. And thank you so much for coming to this Astronomy in the City talk. <laughs>